Yep, are you kicking it back up? It looks like it. Okay, we are rolling. We're rolling or no? We're rolling the audio. Yeah. Life? Can you guys hear us? If you guys can hear us, type something, uh, but let's go ahead and begin. I'm going to go ahead and start, okay? Yeah. All right. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I If we all talk about the same old link building tactics that have been used for five years, that's not fresh. That's not new. Um, and interesting, of course, you guys already know what that is. So I, I look at, I think good examples of this are obviously very large websites. So Wikipedia, there's constantly people, there's moderators, and then there's people constantly adding to content. Sometimes it's not the relevant content, but the moderators are there to kind of keep it, to, to police it. So there's new content being added all the time. And it's one example I, I pull back from the past is Abraham Lincoln, when that first post came out, I think it was about two to 3,000 words or so. That post now has about 15 to 20,000 words or so. Um, and it ranks number one for the word Abraham Lincoln. So people have constantly kept it fresh. And Abraham Lincoln's been gone for a while but they've kept it interesting and you look at yelp people write reviews you know it's interesting it's it's fresh right um so but with abraham lincoln with with that example right mm -hmm. it's they're updating old content mm -hmm. and we can talk about that in our next episode we just said interesting though yeah but so so the real question is is you know you write copy at single grain you're in the mm -hmm. marketing world yep. i'm in the marketing world a lot of the stuff that's out there is already regurgitated how do you keep the content that you're ah, writing is yes. fresh, like new, hip, stuff that people haven't talked about, interesting? Yep. Especially if you're a beginner and you're still learning and you're not sure, hey, this is what I should write about that everyone wants to hear. Like, what's your process for that? Yeah, so that, I have a friend, uh, Kong, he runs a company called Jump Cut. And um, he's really good at video. He's, he's really good at creating like really good ads. And he's also, he's gotten his YouTube channel to 4 million subscribers or so over a billion views. So he knows a thing or two about creative. And what he said is like, you know, people like you all have your own unique experiences. How do you, how do you connect it with something else and make it interesting? So for example, um, let's say I have a background in uh, gaming and Neil has a background in playing tennis, right? Um, and he has a background in marketing. If he molds the two together, if he combines it, and that, that basically has a new fresh approach to it, right? So he can take a bunch of tennis statistics and then mold it with marketing and that becomes more interesting and it's fresh. So it's combining maybe different experiences you have or looking at, you know, if everyone's writing blog posts, maybe you create a video and then that, that's kind of fresh and interesting because everyone's playing in this red ocean, but then you've kind of created a blue ocean for yourself. Another way to keep things fresh and interesting is through the design of your content. So a good example of this is there's a post on Backlinko which breaks down what he learned, uh, him and Eric have learned from over how many million? Five million tag? or so? Five yeah. million title tag variations and A-B tests. And it's an interesting article about SEO. If you guys haven't seen it, check that out. But the way they kept it fresh and interesting wasn't just new data, because I know not all of you guys are able to create the new data, but the graphics help keep it interesting where you want to keep reading more and more. Now you can pay a designer to do that. If you don't have the budget, you can use really affordable tools and free ones like Canva or Infogram. I know Canva has a free version. I don't know if Infogram has a free version. Nonetheless, through them, you can design really cool graphics. Like a lot of my Neil Patel blog posts, I'm using Canva for free to create my graphics. Like I'm not paying a design or anything like that. If you don't have the time to do it yourself, you can go to fiverr.com and find someone for a few bucks, like five bucks to help create the graphics for you as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just share a final example before we close it out. Um, 538, so if you spell out the numbers, the number five, the number 30, the number eight.com. It's, it's a sports blog basically, but they have a lot of really good data visualizations and that kind of separates themselves from everyone else. And Neil used to talk about um, and infographics still work nowadays, but just not as good as before. But you know, he had all these infographics um, with one of the previous blogs that he had and it did really well. You know, a lot of people would share it. He'd get a lot of links for it, um, but it, it's because it's a novel piece of content. It's instead of saying, here's a blog post, it's like, here's some data visualizations, which is like today, but back in the day, you know, infographics which to me is also like another data visualization. So to wrap it up, if you want to keep your content fresh and interesting, few things to do, 
A, consider using graphics. Uh, you don't have to create them yourself. You can use tools like Canva. B, uh, if you don't have data, that's okay. Go gather data around the web. Try to integrate it within your content and link out and cite your sources, of course. C, uh, go try to see what's trending. You can use tools like Google Trends to see what's hot, up and coming. Start talking about more of that kind of stuff versus all the stuff that people have already regurgitated and talked about hundreds and hundreds of times on the web. And last but not least, uh, another thing you can end up doing is uh, look to see what's working in other industries that's not yours and see if you can replicate them in your industry. A good example of this is I used to see how infographics were played out because everyone was using them. Then there was something that came out called infograms. They were more like uh, animated infographics or animographs. I forgot exactly what it was called. I used to call it jiffographics in which the infographic had elements inside that moved and you can see a good example of this by googling how a car engine works infographic and you'll see like pistons firing off and fuel firing off into the engine but i took that from the other industry and i started replicating that into my own industry so if you follow those tactics i think you'll be better off um, that's it for today's episode if you guys want to attend an event with eric and i uh, in malibu make sure you check out marketingschool.io slash live and we'll see you tomorrow all good? Take like one or two questions, maybe one question, then we can move on. I don't on. know if we've got any, because we kind of lost, or we lost some of the people on the first, we gotta get a new link. Oh, okay. We, don't, we just have, we can hear you now. Okay, okay, great, let's just keep going. Yeah. Get your questions in there. Okay, and we are rolling in three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue. And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about how often you should update your old content. So we've talked about this uh, this tactic quite a bit in terms of this is something that's been working really well for us. So um, you know you update a piece of content, you know Google sees it, and then all of a sudden, guess what? You're going to rank for more keywords on that page, and then you're keeping the page fresh. Um, meaning, what tends to happen is all of a sudden, whoa, you're actually ranking higher for that main keyword uh, on that page. So that's why you do it. So the question, Neil, is I know you have full-time staff dedicated to this. I do a lot of the, this content updating stuff. Um, how often do you actually go about updating? What's your cadence? We write one new blog post a week, or technically I do, so that would be four to five a month that I write. Uh, and then as for updating, we have a team of three people, and we update roughly 90 posts a month in English. I do know we update more in Portuguese and a few of the other languages, so my guess is maybe 150, 200,000, I mean 150 to 200 blog posts a month is my guess. And, yeah. and it's worked really well. We first started this in Portuguese, uh, and Portuguese is now about to overtake United States in traffic to our blog. I mean, some of our top performing pieces, when I look at our analytics, is the, the pieces that we've updated. There's one piece I was looking at the other day, and it started about, you know, it started going up. And um, I, I think it was getting like a thousand visits a month or something like that, which is not bad for a, for a blog post. But we decided to hone in on it and, and we, we updated it because it was training in the right direction that the traffic kept going up. So we're like, okay, let's update it. So we added a paragraph and then boom, we kept adding paragraphs maybe every quarter or so. And all of a sudden that post now gets about 25,000 visits a month. And that's great, that's nice, right? So the question is how often do, do, do you update? So one tool that you can use out there is um, there's a content marketing agency out there called Animals, and they actually made a tool that tracks the decay of your content. So they'll look at your, your piece of content from its highest point, and then they'll look at how much it's decayed since the highest point. And then it's, it's a free analysis to do. I think you could just type in animals content tool and then uh, you go and find it. It's, it's free to use. Um, and then there from there, you can kind of make a decision. It's easier for you to make a decision. Um, I'm curious to know kind of what your guys' process is. Sure. So on a quarterly basis, we go through all our content, no matter what. So whether we do that daily, weekly, we just have to make sure we look at all of our content on a quarterly basis. And the first thing we do is anything that's old and outdated that is no longer relevant, we'll just delete it and 301 redirect the URL. A good mm -hmm. example of this is articles we had on Vine, which no longer exist. Twitter acquired them and then they pretty much shut it down. We don't leave them around the web. And the reason being is if someone Googled it and landed on our page, it provides no value. We don't even care if it has a ton of traffic. We do this because it creates the best user experience. The second thing we do is 
We look at content that's dropping in traffic. We do this through Google Search Console, so on a monthly basis. We look at month over month, what are our pages that are losing the most amount of traffic. That gives us the idea of the pages that have the issues. And we first go into those and adjust them and tweak them. And that's mainly our two-step formula. It works really well and it keeps it simple. And that way we always prioritize the pages with the biggest drop-offs. Yeah. There's another tool out there, uh, Content Explorer from Ahrefs. It does actually sh look at your, allow you to look kind of in, into your space so you know maybe like two or three competitive blogs. You can kind of get a sense of how often they're updating their content. Um, when I look at, um, let's say when I look at Backlinko, Backlinko doesn't have that many blog posts on his site, but what he does do is he updates quite a bit of his content. I'm looking at, you know, it looks like a 25% ratio sometimes, 25 to 30%, it's a lot. Um, but he, he's, He's kind of the exception because a lot of us are publishing more. We have more than just 30 posts he on our site. 25, 30% per month? Not actually, yeah, it looks like that when you look at the Content Explorer tool. Yeah, yeah it's not bad. It, but you got it right. And he's able to do that because he has, I don't know how many pieces of content. My guess is around 40. Probably more now, yeah. Uh, yeah. So because it, the quantity isn't there, he goes more in depth on each article. That's worked really well for him. Mm -hmm. It's, it's easier to maintain. If you write too much content, it makes it harder and harder to maintain. I gave a speech in a conference in Utah a few weeks ago, and I was telling them, I'm like, look, the biggest mistake everyone's making here in the room is they create new content versus updating their old content. And if you go into your search console and look at the last 16 months, you'll find that a lot of your most popular pieces of content are just dying and dying in traffic, and you're subsidizing by writing new content instead of just updating and fine-tuning the old existing articles. The analogy I always give is like, you know, you don't go buy a car and then throw it away after like a couple months. You know, you, you drive it. Well, hopefully you're not wasting money, but you drive it to the ground. Um, and you don't just, you know, drive it to the ground means 10 plus years. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Most people won't do that. But if you're really frugal, you, then you would do that. <laughs> My uh, parents had 17 years for our car. It must have been a Toyota. <laughs> it was a Toyota. There you go. There you go. <laughs> the Asian way. Um, anyway, so do you have anything to add? No, that's it. I think you guys have the formula. As I mentioned, I review my content, all of it, at least once a quarter. And on a monthly basis, we look at the content that has the biggest drop by doing a comparison within Google Search Console. The ones that have the biggest drop are the ones we update the most frequently. All right, so go to marketingschool.io slash live, that's L-I-V, if you'd like to hang out with Neil and myself in Malibu. This is gonna happen early November. And right now, we only have a few spots left. Not fake scarcity, it's real scarcity. So marketingschool.io slash live, L-I-V-E, and we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, maybe we'll answer one question. Yeah, let's do it. How about the future of podcasting in India? My car is 2008. Great job, Tara. Um, okay, I, Lucas right here. I, a lot of doubts when we talk about investing in an inside sales team. We have a freemium B2B app, pretty cheap, so LTV is $300. So Lucas, um, LTV, lifetime value of $300 for a product and the inside sales team, I think it's a tough it's a tough racket. I don't think it's going to work. Um, based on some of the numbers I've seen in the past, you, you should have an LTV um, or an ACV of, so annual contract value of at least $3,000. Otherwise, the numbers aren't going to work for you if you have an inside sales team, unless you somehow make it work in like a, you know, maybe not a first world country. But um, I, I just think it's tough. What are your thoughts, Neil? Uh, it was the, what was the question in, inside sales team with the LTV of 300 bucks. I, I don't that, think it's that is work. very hard. It depends what region though. In the United States, that is really hard. In some other regions like Brazil, the 300 would be 1,200 and you could potentially make it work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the United States for $300, I would try to do self-service and I would consider doing webinars uh, and have uh, the webinar sell for you because it's much easier to do a $300 price point over the phone. Yep. I understand it may not be 300 up front, but it should be easier to get the whole 300. Oh, Brazil. Over, yeah, Brazil. So it works. So it works. If you're in Brazil, I think you could do inside sales for 1000 200 reais. Right now, I think the exchange rate is a bit more, so uh, you should be able to make it happen. There you have it. Um, Justin has a question here. I think maybe we'll, we'll save it, Justin. So stay till the end, Justin. But um, should you niche down on your, he's asking why we didn't niche down on our agencies. Happy to answer that. Um, Alex coming in from Alabama. Um, thank you. And let's go ahead and go with the next one. Then we'll go with the LinkedIn questions. Hey, rolling. Three, one minute. Two, go for it. One. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue, And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about how to leverage content marketing when you are selling multiple products. Oh, how fun. Uh, who wants to go first? 
If that You'll, means I want to go first because you looked at me. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. I, I, okay, so here, here's my take on this. This, so to me, content marketing is podcasting, it's video, it's blog, it's speaking. That, that to me, even throwing a dinner to me is content marketing because like you're, you're creating a great experience for someone. Um, so to me, I like doing all these things, and the audiences slowly grow some faster than others. Um, and I stick around, I try to stick around marketing, right? So if my audience continues to grow around marketing, then I can build around marketing. I can either build or I can acquire, and then I can plug things into my audience where I know um, there's a certain segment of my audience where there's a specific need and it serves them. So basically right now, like if you think about our entire funnel, like the podcast Neil and I do right now, this is our free content, right? Then we have like our premium content too. Like people want like connection. And then Neil has like uh, Uber suggest, right? Which I'll let him talk about in a second. I have ClickFlow, which serves like a need too, and more more so targeting the enterprise area. But we're, we're, we're targeting different areas that we know we, where we can help our audience. And that's what I love about, um, what I love about content marketing. Cause it doesn't just pigeonhole into us doing one thing. It allows us to expand. Cause I get bored easily. Well, it, it, see Eric and I though, still, when we do content marketing, we're still in the same space. If you look at everything, it's all marketing related. So mm -hmm. it's a bit easier, but now imagine your e-commerce site, you're selling hairbrushes, makeup, you're selling all these different kinds of things. Content marketing does get a bit more difficult mm -hmm. due to the fact that you're not continually offering the same thing. Because if you look at most of your companies, single grain office traffic generation, ClickFlow offers mm -hmm. you more traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the meetups, events you do, in mm -hmm. essence, you're teaching people how to get more traffic. Yep. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're gonna do content marketing, you have a lot of different products. The only solution that I know is, you go and create categories and you go and create content around all the stuff that you're selling, or you can end up creating lists like let's say you have a ton of beauty products, but they all serve different things. Like you can do lists like um, 10 essential beauty products that you should always travel with. Not the best title, but you guys get the point. And then you can start going after one, two, three, four, and they can all be different types of products that serve different needs. And you can break down why people should use them to look more beautiful or feel better or whatever maybe and generate sales at the same time. I think HubSpot's a really good example of this. They have they create so much different content and we've talked about how they create blockchain content, but they have their CRM, they have their email service provider, they have a chat bot, they have all these different little um, products within HubSpot, the suite, and somehow they make it work. And so I, I think um, I think it was Tony it was Tony Robbins that said this, but it's like if you if you're like a movie star and you you tend to stay around Hollywood, like things are gonna work out for you. But if you're a movie star and you try to go into like doing um, maybe you you try to become like like, I don't know, like a game developer or something. It's, it's A, you're starting from scratch again. You don't have the relationship. It's, it's way harder. But if you keep building on top of content marketing, then eventually you're going to be allowed to, um, you're going to be allowed to venture into different areas where you can offer different products and different services. Yeah, and look, with content marketing, the thing that you need to look at is if you have a lot of different products and services, I would consider first tackling the ones that are more popular. Do keyword research, look at which products are gonna sell the most. If you're unsure, even when you do keyword research, a simple hack is you can go to Amazon, see what's the most popular products and services within your category and look at the number of ratings and more ratings usually means that there's more buyers or serve, uh, more buyers and that'll give you an idea which products are the most hot from there start creating content around those products. Same with services, if you offer a lot of services, go look to see which ones are the most popular. First go and create content around those. And then once you saturate a lot of the content in the space and you're running out ideas, then go and start creating content around the ideas that aren't as popular. All right, so that is it for today. But before we go, don't forget to rate, review, to, uh, and, and subscribe to this podcast. And before we go, before we go, um, Neil and I would like to see you in person in, in Malibu. Malibu. November, early November, November 4th and 5th. And to apply, go to marketingschool.io slash live, that's L-I-V-E. And if you apply, you personally get a call from me um, if your application looks like it's a fit. So I'll personally call you, guaranteed. All right, see you tomorrow. <laughs> it's true, I call them. I call them. And those of you that are watching the stream right now, I will call you too. Um, let's keep going. Let's go to like two more, then we'll answer a question. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue. And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're gonna to talk about our favorite marketing blogs for 2020 and beyond. So 
marketing. There's new stuff coming. Other all than the time. ours. Other than ours. So neilpatel.com is a very good marketing blog. Same with single grain, yeah. but let's not talk about yeah. ours. Let's, we'll not talk about ours. So I'll, I'll start first. So Andrew Chen .co, Um He he's ex Uber. He's been in the growth, still in Valley kind of growth um, circles for a very long time. He tends to release one epic essay every single month. And I, when I say essay, it's like very long form. It's very thoughtful, a lot of data points, very um, smart, very intelligent. And so I recommend reading that if you like to just be aware of kind of what's going on because he's now a um he, he's now a venture capitalist at Andreessen Horowitz one of the premier um VC firms out there and just super smart guy if they hire a guy like that you, you know he's he's down smart so I met his sister before Ada super smart girl too um and she has her own business so um recommend reading that yeah another one that I love is at age so there's all these big fortune 500 1000 companies none of us can really relate to them because they're so large and we're not there yet that's okay though but here's the beautiful part they talk about on ad age trends and things that these big companies are focusing on. And some of them you can end up doing for pennies on the dollar. And here's the beautiful part. When they start talking about trends, they know that they're going to catch on. A lot of these companies are going to go after them. So a, you can consider offering them as services and start selling them. So if you're an agency, that's a good way to make money. But B, a lot of times early on, it's quick for an individual entrepreneur to do these things, such as they talk about voice search a lot. You can tap into voice search for very little to no money. You don't even have to buy a Alexa device to start marketing your business through voice search. You can use tools like Jetson AI. And when you start seeing those trends by catching on to them early, especially being small, you can end up getting a lion's share of that traffic from those channels because you know all the big guys are gonna take forever to adapt. Yeah. Number three, I guess, uh, I like ProfitWell. We've talked about ProfitWell in the past. Patrick Campbell, Campbell is a friend of ours. Um, he's just really good at understanding kind of, you know, where SaaS is. Um, he's a super smart product guy and really good at pricing, which is what his company is based on. Um, they also have a free product there too. So whenever they release something, it's really good. And they have a new video series now, actually with um, one of Neil's partners, Heaton. Patrick and Heaton are doing a video series now um, on basically um, I, something around product. I forget what it is, but they, they try to push the, the boundaries when it comes to content. Another blog that I love is Conversion XL. It's from a guy named Peep. And the one thing that is certain, as they say in this life, is taxes, death. What's well, that technically, one? if you live in Puerto Rico, there's only death. You don't really get yeah, taxed. What, what's it saying? Taxes, death? Death you know and taxes. It? Death and taxes. Well, there's a third thing that is a guaranteed. Cost for marketing is continually going to rise because you know Google AdWords and Facebook ads are going to continually rise as well. So I love Conversion Excels because it tells me new conversion techniques that I can test out and try. Because if I can boost my conversion rates by extra 10, 20, 30 percent, it allows me to compete with the bigger companies who have more budgets than me. Uh, and at the same time, in addition to Conversion Excel, also check out VWO. I know that's a website with, that does A-B testing, but what I love about VWO is they post a lot of case studies of other people who have run successful conversion tests using their tool. That also gives me ideas of tests that I can run that'll help me boost my conversion rates. All right, so I guess this is like number six. So uh, hot pod news. We've talked about this one in the past, but it, when it comes to podcasting news, um, this guy focuses completely on it. Um, what's happening in, in the industry, big acquisitions that are going on. So constantly following that because the, the podcasting uh, market in the U.S. I think believe is now six hundred million a year. Um, it's I think it's grown to like seven or eight billion in, in China. Um, last time I, I mentioned it was like six billion or so, but it's getting bigger and bigger. So I'm constantly monitoring it. Neil's monitoring it too because we're doing we're literally doing a podcast right now. So um, we put our time into. So why not look at it? Because voice is the future. Another site slash blog that I like looking at is Product Hunt. It's not necessarily a blog, but a lot of marketers end up talking about new tools and features that they're releasing there. So when Intercom has a release as a marketer, I use them. I'll at least get notified because on Product Hunt, I can see it and usually I'll see it there before any other place. The same goes with like SEO tools or people making changes. A lot of stuff I find on Product Hunt, like when Hotjar makes a lot of changes, they release it there. Uh, it's just a great place to see what's new and trending. That way as a marketer, you can catch on again before everyone else. All right, last, last one from my side. I'll, I'll give a couple. So swiped.co, I like this website because I can go look at old school copywriting swiped, uh, swipe copy. Human psychology doesn't change. So I wanna know what kind of hooks people, what gets people when it, when it comes to writing copy. And I encourage you, it doesn't matter if you're writing like a social media post, a, a, an ad or something like that. You have to become good at copywriting if you wanna be a good marketer. So I recommend looking at those. Uh, land-book.com is one for landing page inspiration because you know at the end of the day, 
I know I'm not original, so I like to draw inspiration from people. Uh, and then I get ideas on how to, you know, pump out nice landing pages. And then um, what else do I, those are, those are two. And then, oh, user onboard. That's been kind of really top of mind for me because um, onboarding to me is also how you market your product. If you don't do a good job of onboarding, guess what? People aren't going to retain. Like onboarding is kind of hand in hand with retention sometimes. And the last one for me is Google did over 3000 algorithm changes last year. Expect that number to keep going up and up. One blog that I like checking out every time there's a Google algorithm update and you will need to use this blog in 2020 sometime is Search Engine Roundtable. It's an old one. A lot of people in the industry don't really read it uh, as much uh, unless you're like old school and you're an expert. More people go to like Search Engine Land or Journal or one of those places. Um, but check out Search Engine Roundtable. Anytime there's a Google algorithm update or signs of one, Barry does more updates than I've seen than anyone else and the community chimes in and everyone's talking about what's happening, what they're seeing with their traffic. Is it going up or down? Is it affecting a specific industry? So that's really well worth uh, all of you guys paying attention to. So that way if something's happening, you can have a pulse right then and there in real time. So I'll, I'll say what I do in the morning. I, sometimes we take for granted what we know, but I, I look at my phone um, and it, I, I use an RSS uh, reader called Feedly and search into Roundtable. Actually, I use um, one also called uh, nuzzle, which pulls kind of what people are tweeting a lot. And I follow some SEO people. And what always happens is search into roundtable keeps rising to the top. So I'm pretty much aware day of when an algorithm hit, hit algorithm update hits before my team knows that's kind of my secret. And I, I you know, that's the secret for you guys. Not um, anymore. Your yeah. team's listening now. Now they know hopefully, but just to be aware, it's like, Oh, like traffic's d disappearing. Why is it happening? And it's like, okay, let's just look at that. So yeah. anything else? Well, that's it. Eric and I want to meet you in person in Malibu. Check out marketingschool.io slash live to attend. All right, one more, then we'll answer a question. Ready? One minute. I'm going to modify the title. All right. We're holding. We're rolling. Uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, wherever you're coming from. More questions. Anthony Lopez, hello. Uh, podcasting sounds like it's been growing globally. How many years do you think it'll take for the medium to plateau? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'll it's say only at least four or five years. It's still yeah. in its infancy. It's, it's so small in the U.S. Um, it's I, I, in some regions like China, I know it's still growing, but I yeah. think it'll start plateauing soon. I, 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 th I say four to five years. Yeah, I'd yeah. say around four to five years. Yeah. Yeah, in regions like India, podcasting still isn't as uh, as popular as it could yeah. be. Same with like Latin America. Yeah. Four or five years, I would say, for at least U.S. and some of the major markets. Uh, some of the other regions like Latin America and other parts of Asia, Yeah. maybe a bit longer, like seven, eight years. Yeah. Um, Eileen, that is a really good topic. How do you decide when to monetize your podcast with ads? I think I'm literally going to steal that headline because it's better than what I put. Okay. Um, Jess Pacheco, what is your formula for building a high converting landing page? How about we put that in there too? What is the high converting landing page formula? I like that one. Great job, Jess. Okay. Um, so do, you, do you care what date I moved the title for the podcast one? Nope. Nope. And then Khalid's coming from Dublin. Khalid, I'm actually going to be in Dublin uh, October 13th through the 18th. So I'm going to enjoy it because I'm going to go um, shoot clay pigeons. Are you really? Yeah. That's what we did last time. It's great. So clay pigeons, not real ones. I mean, I don't know why they call them clay pigeons. It's like those discs. So I don't know why they call them clay pigeons. Uh -huh. Yeah. But it's not like a, it's, it's not like a pigeon, though. Why don't you just say disc? Uh, you know, why, yeah. why don't they just shoot off a fake pigeon like a clay yeah. pigeon that yeah, looks like, like and go <laughs> quack 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 you know uh, all right let's go uh, we're still rolling all right and three two one go Eric you're next welcome to another episode of marketing school I'm Eric Sue and I'm Neil Patel and today we're going to talk about how to get the most out of Google Analytics so I can go first so Google Analytics you want to get good at Google Analytics? I'll, I'll give you one thing first. So Kaushik.net, this is an Indian last name. I didn't know you were pronouncing it right. K-A-U-S-H. 
H I K dot net. I think I got it. Um, but search for, just search Avinash Kaushik. Okay, you'll find you'll find it. And um, he still writes on his blog. I think it's still like once a month or so. But he's got kind of the comprehensive uh, blog around Google Analytics because he I think he still works for Google or at least he's an evangelist if I'm not mistaken. I have no idea if he's still there. He's also written some amazing books called like Web Analytics an Hour a Day. Yeah, we're checking out um, and you know consider. Uh, getting the books as well if you mm -hmm. want the most out of Google Analytics. Another thing you need to do is, look, you guys already know the basics like goal tracking and all that kind of stuff and tracking conversions. So let's get into some stuff that you guys probably aren't looking at. One of the things I would look at is cohort reports. So Google has a cohort report. You can either break it down by day, weeks, or months. I usually like looking at weeks and then I do a 12 month interval. It'll tell me how many people are continually coming back um, so what a cohort does, it'll look at all the people that came to your site today or this week and how many of them came back the next week, then the week after, then the week after, etc. And when you look at it, let's say over a three month time period, and then, you know, for my website, I'm like, crap, only 2.6 or 2.7% of people are coming back. My problem isn't getting traffic. My problem is retaining the audience that I have. Like I look at my traffic on a monthly basis and I'm like, all right, yeah, I get millions of visitors a month, but majority never come back after three months. So what I start doing is creating different things and elements to try to get more people to come back and I run tests. And the cool thing with the cohort report is when you release tests, it'll show you your cohort report on a daily basis as well. So you can instantly see after 24 or 48 hours if the test is helping improve retention as well. Yeah, and I think it's really important to understand how to read cohort charts. A lot of people don't, um, they haven't looked into it. So I just literally Google how to how to read a cohort chart and then go from there. Um, really important to understand all the the changes that you're making on your site. The other thing I'll say is adding annotation. So in the last episode, we talked about if a Google algorithm update hits, what happens? Like we'll look at search engine roundtable, right? But we also annotate it inside our analytics just so we can see over time, like what are the big events that are happening? So we have a better understanding of like maybe why, what caused the traffic to drop or a spike. Um, so annotations are important. I think uh, segmentations are important too. So advanced segmentation instead of looking at all your traffic together maybe you segment out your really engaged traffic so people that are you know uh visiting your site for more than two minutes or so or people that have converted and then you can compare that versus like your overall traffic just to see how it's it, the, how it's uh, performing so you can kind of slice and dice the data um, i think that's important and then talking about getting the most out of google analytics don't forget to hook it in with your google ads and don't forget to hook it in with your google search console because then if you hook in with search console you can have conversion data with, with those pages too and then you can also look at your campaigns all in one area too yeah also check out their cross, cross device uh feature that ends up breaking out the overlap in which you know how many people are on your website for mobile desktop tablet if you're seeing a lot of crossover then you know that you can have um, similar messages on all of them to start targeting people. But if you don't, you can start adjusting up the messages because maybe, hey, mobile people aren't coming back on their desktop or whatever it may be. So let's see how I can end up fixing this. Um, the other thing that I love looking at within Google Analytics is the devices that are using my website. And here's why this is really important. As SEOs, a lot of time we take mobile traffic for granted. Sometimes we get a lot, sometimes we get a little. And a lot of us SEOs, yeah, we have mobile responsive websites, but we also have AMP pages. So with Google Analytics, you can see how many people are coming to your AMP pages and you'll be like, oh, my mobile traffic doesn't convert as well. And the big reason is I see a lot of SEOs using AMP pages and AMP strips off everything. So all the conversion elements are gone. You gotta go back and add it in. That's another thing to check out in Google Analytics to see if that's you. Cause if it is, fixing that will boost your revenue. Yeah, and don't forget about multi-touch attribution too. So a lot of people like to attribute everything to last click attribution, meaning if I click on Neil's ad and I um, and I buy, then it doesn't take into account all the other channels that I hit. Maybe I came from organic first and then maybe I came through social. Um, but looking at just last click attribution is just giving all the credit to the ad, but it doesn't take into account the other areas. So it's not the, I wouldn't say it's, it's the most um, accurate, but it at least gives you a sense of where your conversions are coming from, where your assisted conversions are coming from. So clicking on multi-touch attribution um, can be helpful for you. And let's see, what else? You mentioned goal tracking too. So goal tracking, e-commerce tracking too. These things take time to set up. Um, but you don't want to skimp on them. And the final thing I'll add is, you know, looping in Google Tag Manager and then, you know, looking at all your other, other analytics tags, um, that just makes it easier to manage analytics overall. So you don't need to worry about um, getting more engineering help for, you know, tasks that they don't want to do. 
Yeah, and another thing that I love in Google Analytics is benchmarking. We're all known to use similar web or SEM rush or even Uber suggests for benchmarking, but Google Analytics has better benchmarking data than most of the other places that I've seen. The reason being is there's a lot of Google Analytics tracking codes on people's websites, so it's much more accurate. Um, and within there, you can use their benchmarking reporting to see how you stack up against your competition, which will give you insights on if you're doing well or poorly, uh, when there's a change in an algorithm, how do you benchmark compared to them? Because you can see, hey, have other people got hit in their traffic? Are they still doing well or is it just me? All right. So I, I think this one's pretty good. We can always do another one. But that is it for today. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. But before we go, also, also, if you want to hang out with Neil and I in Malibu, November 4th and 5th, in person, we have an application live. It's marketingschool.io slash live. That's L-I-V-E. And if your application looks like it's qualified, I will personally give you a call that's guaranteed and we'll have a great conversation. And uh, that being said, see you tomorrow. Should we answer one question? Yeah, let's go for it. Uh, let's see. Those are, okay. I'm a professional video editor. This is Pro Media Hub. Um, how could I market myself to a DMA to get a job? No, what's a DMA? Yeah. Oh, okay. You can send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> send, send Noah at singlegrain.com. Yeah. Email. Send Noah at singlegrain.com an email. Pro Media Hub. Yeah. Uh, actually, literally, that's something we need help with, right? Yeah, so, yeah. okay, yeah. Send us, send us a, yeah. If you're a video editor and you'd like to work with um, Singlegrain, uh, Noah at singlegrain.com. Or if you want to work with Neil, uh, send it to Mike at singlegrain.com. You mean Mike at neilpatel.com? Oh, sorry. Mike at neilpatel.com. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Well, thank you. You saved me. Yeah. All right. Next one. Do you have someone who works for you that's named Mike? We used to. You'd be like, why am I getting all these emails? Mike Ball. Um, Jumping in right right in? Yeah. Ready for the next one? Let's go. Future podcasting in India is fantastic. You know why? Because it's growing in China and the US. And it's it's actually pretty... I I think I read on The Economist somewhere, but... um, I think in the next uh, 10 years or so, India is slated to become number one. We'll see. And then China, number two. And then US, number three. For podcasting? No, just overall GDP. I doubt that. but We'll I, see. I'll bet you. In 10 years? I'll I bet think, you 10 I years. China will explode and India yeah. will go up. But yeah. India is really far behind. They have a lot more people, though. They do. Yeah. The US has less people than China. We've still yeah. been strong for a very long time. Yeah. Well, not to get into politics, but yeah. yeah. Ready? That's economic. Rolling. Well, it is economics, not politics. but it kind of goes into politics. Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue, And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about the best marketing courses for digital marketers. So Neil, I was actually looking at YouTube um, about a week ago and I think it was like in the evening and then I saw a video with you and it didn't look like a normal video. So I clicked it and uh, it was, what's it called? Agency Unleashed? agency unlocked i was yeah. like i was like wait what is what is agency unlocked so i watched the whole webinar and it was actually really good um so you know first we'll talk about other people's first and we can talk about the stuff that we have maybe sure, that's fair. yeah we, we have agency unlocked on my end you have leveling up right mm-hmm. um brian dean has a good one on youtube and he also has a good one on link building those are worth checking out seo that works and then um youtube that works i don't know yeah and there's stuff and you don't have to pay for marketing courses either i know some of the stuff that we're mentioning right now costs money Mm -hmm. but let's go over some free stuff like hubspot has hubspot's uh, always good uh, hubspot has a lot of free certification courses that teach you a lot on marketing this is great especially if you're starting off uh google adwords has certification stuff that helps Mm -hmm. you get started with google adwords there's also what's those course sites um coursera coursera udemy, udemy, udemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah udemy has like a coursera those guys have a lot yeah. of stuff that's like on seo and all those things yeah and they're dirt cheap like 20 30 dollars mm-hmm. um there's linda which is now linkedin learning yeah that's true they changed yeah. the name yeah uh, where digital else? marketer has good stuff yeah digital marketer is really affordable yep. there's a there's a slack community that's really good this isn't a course yep. but this teaches you a lot about marketing and people share the latest and greatest techniques it's called like growth something what is it traffic think tank traffic think tank there yeah. you go um and that one's purely based off of slack it's not necessarily course format but that helps and i think that's pretty affordable like 60 yep. bucks or 100 mm-hmm. bucks a month oh no it's like 119 now a month oh they increase the price yeah it was 99 now it's 119 got it yeah um what else is good that's free you you know i found is a lot of marketers are trying to find courses to learn everything 
but marketing has been changing in which I remember when you and I started, it was mm -hmm. like, all right, how can I learn SEO, pay-per-click, social media? Be Those are like well the rounded. big ones. Yeah. And now yeah. we're just like, how can I specialize and be the best at this one channel? Cause there's so many and mm -hmm. too many. And once I'm amazing at it, you know, that's great. I'm just going to specialize and focus in this one area. You can find a lot of YouTube videos for free. That'll help you educate. Uh, Brian Dean also has a lot of YouTube videos. You do, I do. Uh, Ahrefs has a lot of YouTube videos that educate us. Ahrefs well. has a good course too. Um, I, I, I was um, with with a group of friends, and then uh, we were having breakfast, and uh, this guy's like, you know. Yeah, Tim, has a, Tim's course is Yeah, good. blogging for business. And yeah. so 800 bucks, right? And then I was like, gonna, hey, can you just give me the password? And it's like, oh, it logs in my Ahrefs account. Okay, fine. So I instantly paid the 800 bucks for it. And now we have it. And I went through like a couple of the videos. Like, this is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, there's a lot of good courses out there. Again, there's free solutions if you want as well. Now, keep one thing in mind. I think this is the big mistake people make when they go after courses. They'll buy a course and they think they're good and they're done. Even if you learn everything and implement it, marketing changes. That's why sometimes Eric and I will tell you something now. And in six months, we may tell you something different. And you guys will be like, oh, you guys uh, contradicted yourself. And we don't try to do this on purpose. And we do apologize for that. Uh, but marketing changes. So as the market changes, we adapt with it. And the same goes with courses. If you buy a course or you use leverage a free one and you learn and you implement everything that you're learning over time, expect marketing to change. And not everything that you learned in the course to be relevant uh, or even be accurate. So for that reason, you always have to continually learn and you have to continually adapt so that way you can stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, my take on it, I'm going to read this com this YouTube comment afterwards, but my, my take on it, you should look at the bottom. Anyway, my, my take on courses, why, why should you pay for courses? So I think, look, if you're looking for the, if you can't afford it, if you're just starting out, I would recommend looking at all the free stuff. So to Neil's point, our YouTube channels, it's free. This podcast, it's free. My other podcast, it's free. There's always a, a layer of free, right? Um, but even a lot of the most prolific kind of content creators out there, they have the paid versions too. So it's not like we're selling out, but I've worked in online education for a while. And I, I can tell you that the, um, the completion rate when it's like, let's say it's something that's free, it's, 2%. So it's 98% people actually don't finish a course. The reason for that is because when you have something for free, human psychology, you aren't, you're not held accountable. There's no incentive for you to really finish it off unless you're super motivated, you're to 2%. So, but if you charge for something, then the, the completion rate goes a lot higher because at least they put some skin into the game. Right? So I guess, Neil, my question for you for agency unlocked, um, why, like we do all this free stuff, like why even decide to charge for something? Yeah. Um, it, it was so expensive to end up producing that it would be hard to just give it away for free. Um, and I've done courses, I've given away both paid and free. And what's funny is, I, I know this sounds counterintuitive, when I release the free courses, less people take action and I have less success stories even though more people have access. It's kind of like what you just mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, when I go into even my older courses like uh, Advanced Marketing Program, which I no longer sell, I have so many more success stories because people paid some sort of money and because they paid some sort of money, they took action like you mentioned. And they're grateful for it too. Yeah, but for me, you know, and I know you're the same as well. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't care if you're, you're grateful if I help you grow your business or not. Mm -hmm. I'm just happy if you succeed. And to me, that's enough. And I know you're similar, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for some reason, I found that when I charge for something, even if it's seven bucks, for some weird reason, people believe that it adds more value and they're convert more. I don't know why. Just, right. They get better results. Yep. I, I can speak to leveling up for a second too. That that's uh, kind of our individual and team training and the. A lot of people are like, okay, like, how do I train my team exactly? How do I train? Uh, how do I train? You know, how do I just train myself? And like, they ask for additional features, right? So maybe there's a Slack group that they want. Maybe there's a Facebook group that they want. Maybe there's additional support that they want. These are the things we can offer if we if we charge for it. But at the same time, look, if you can't pay for it, totally fine. You can have like a free layer, right? Um, but I think at, at least from my perspective, it's like, okay, there's people that really they're ready to commit to the next level. There's always a group of people, let's say the audience, your, your audience is um, a big piece of your audience is consuming stuff for free, but then there's a, there's a next level that's motivated and they want, they're ready to pay. And then beyond that, they want to pay for the next level too. And the next level and the next level. So take that into account. We're not saying, you know, you should charge or you shouldn't charge. It's just kind of, you know, where we landed right now and kind of the progression of, of where we've been. Um, and do you want to add anything else, Neil? 
Yeah, if you want to hang out with Eric and I, check out marketingschool.io slash live. Uh, we're throwing an event in November in Malibu. Make sure you go there, check it out, fill in your details, and we'll be in touch soon. Goodbye. Neil, what's ISRO? Is that India? Space? I I, I, Space rocket. Oh. Yeah, I just looked it up. Oh, I had no clue what that it meant. It's supposed to be a very reliable rocket, uh -huh. but the satellite got stuck in the... Ah. That's okay. They tried. Yeah. Try again. Uh, storytelling for business. Go to singlegrain.com slash leveling dash up. And welcome to the podcast. Hi, Neil. Dear friend of mine. This is Alberto Antonici. Hello, Alberto. Pleasure to meet you. Hey, son. Neil, you helped me a lot. You're welcome. Thank when, you. Whenever I see that writing, I'm like, he's rich. Which one? Oh, the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my advice on TikTok is they just actually inked a deal with the NFL. I think it's so early. Um, the retention on TikTok isn't that amazing. I would wait a little bit more for it to be more popular before you consider joining. Radio. Yeah. So we got seven done so far. Yeah, I think these are longer than our normal ones right now. Yeah, they are. Hey, Daniel. Hello from Sweden. It must be like... 10 p.m. for you. No, we're, we're like eight minutes, seven minutes, seven minutes, four minutes. Yeah. We're average. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Yeah, we're rolling in three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue. And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about how do you decide when to monetize your podcast with ads. So, you know, this is interesting because Eric and I have had a debate about this for a long time now. Three years. It, it three has it been three years? It's, we've been doing this over three years now. Yeah, and yeah. you know I've never wanted to monetize through ads. Mm -hmm. Being blunt, Eric's been more open to the concept. I'm always open. <laughs> Eric's <laughs> always more open. Even when we did the in-person event, I never wanted to charge for tickets. And Eric mentioned to the audience like he did a live survey. Yes, I did. Say, he's just like, hey, how many would you pay for an event? Um, we just have different of opinions there. Mm -hmm. Now with podcasting, uh, you know, it takes up space from us, office space. It takes team. It takes people. Travel time for uh, you, travel time, actual time. time. Yeah. Uh, and in general, we're starting to lose more and more money on podcasting. I look at things, if you can keep losing the money, that's fine. Um, and there's a point where Eric and I were just like, okay, we want to get better equipment. We want to have higher quality audio. Um, we want to keep creating more and more material for people in addition to the podcast. How can we and create... I got a new place to have a nicer studio yeah. too. Yeah. You're like, how can we create eBooks, all this kind of stuff and just yeah. give away more stuff for free. And we're looking at all this stuff and it costs money. You know, for us, this is the point where we're like, hey, all right, let's start having ads. Um, and we found someone, there's a lot of people that approach us for ads. We found someone, DreamHost, that we're working with at the moment to roll out ads with. And the key is, you know, finding a company that A, you believe in, B, that fits the audience, because for us, at least marketing, if your site loads faster, you improve your conversion rates and load time. But it came down to, you know, if you're okay with losing the expenses, fine. If you want to turn, make something bigger, uh, like we're trying to create more material, more get better equipment, we're trying to add more value so you guys can grow your businesses faster and get more traffic. We're like, all right, the only way to do this is we either, Eric and I, we were estimating the cost. It would cost us roughly nineteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 combined a month, or we get some advertisers to help cover the costs. I think in, in many, like, let's say Neil and I might not see things eye to eye exactly, but in, in some ways we kind of come back to the same thing where it's like, we, we just want to grow faster. So the money is kind of a means to end to grow faster because you already know me. It's not like I plan to pocket it. It's just like, we want to do yeah, more things. Neither yeah. of us plan on pocketing that money. We're just like, all right, yeah. how can we do more stuff? Yep. And speaking of more stuff, like we're doing an in-person event in Malibu in November. If you want to learn more, make sure you go to marketingschool.io slash live. But in general, if you're thinking about monetizing your podcast, if you really need the money, do it then. Or if you want to do more, then you can consider doing it because then you can use that cash for more. But the one thing I would tell you is don't monetize unless you have at least 50,000 monthly listeners. 
I think if you monetize too early, it can hurt you. Yeah, I, I think um, in most cases, I, I agree with that. But remember, we talked about this guy from uh, Japan that he did this Japan startup podcast. I think he was getting like 8,000 downloads a month or something or 5,000 and he was making like eight grand or so. So if you actually find the right sponsor and you feel like you're delivering something that really exclusive and the right niche, because yep. if the niche is big enough where a customer's worth a lot, you can make mm-hmm. a ton of money. But if you're like in a broad category, yep. uh, like, I don't know, furniture or household or housing i don't know whatever it is Mm -hmm. a a few thousand podcast listeners isn't going to do much for you yeah and i I think look you only you are going to know when it's the right timing for it but um if if your audience is not that big i think focus more on delivering value than anything because if you start polluting it's like when you start a blog first if you pollute the blog with too many ads in the beginning google guess what if you're a brand new website, Google doesn't look favorably on that and it, it becomes difficult for you, right? So if you start to pollute things with ads too quickly um, and you don't really have a good understanding of who your audience is, what they want exactly, uh, that's gonna not be a good experience for your listeners. And the listeners are what help attract the advertisers at the end of the day. Anything else? Yeah, the, the last thing is, is if you decide to monetize your podcast and you don't need the cash, take that money, don't pocket it, dump it all back into your podcast and make it grow faster. Because it's right. good branding. It's still early in the podcasting age in which if you do that and you double down in three, four years, it'll definitely pay off for you. You look at people like Lewis Howes and they're like, oh, he does extremely well from his podcast. He's just been re- resilient at it. He keeps doing it. He keeps dumping his money back in. And it takes a long time before you get to a stage where you're all going to be happy. And, and there's only 700,000 podcasts as, as of this, uh, this recording, which is Globally nothing. or just on iTunes? Globally. Well, that's not that many. Yeah, it's not much at all. So now it's still an opportunity to get in. And to me, I, I feel like podcasting is easier to do than blog posts. But I think you also need to have experience accumulate before you can do podcasts. Um, anyway, that is it for today. Uh, if you'd like to see us live in Malibu, this is a small event. It's an intimate event, November 4th and 5th. Uh, marketingschool.io slash live. That's L-I-V-E. Go to apply, and if your application is qualified, I will actually call you myself. It's not going to be a machine. I'm going to call you myself, and we'll have a conversation, see if it's the right fit, and go from there. Goodbye. Uh, We'll answer one question. Jaya. 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 Uh, Michael, yes, these are chopped up and put on Spotify and YouTube. Or, sorry, not. maybe it is on YouTube, too, because this live hangs. The live just stays there, but we're going to chop. Okay, got it. No, that makes sense. Um, love from India, Pro Media Hub, all good. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, J G J, should I monetize with my ten-year-old company brand or created brand new brand, brand new brand, um, like Marketing School versus Single Grain Neil Patel Digital? I think if you can just stay with your company brand instead of creating a new one, I think it takes a lot of work. Marketing School works because it's the effort of both Neil and myself. Um, and then, you know, we have our own things going on. Is podcasting the new YouTube in 2020? Um, you mean, if it's, is it like the new big channel? Is it the new big trend? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Especially with voice search like Alexa, Google Home and all those. I think it's going to be really huge. Yeah, and all those fax schema is all like for voice search. All right, let's do it. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue, And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about how to skyrocket your traffic in two days. Where did this title come from? <laughs> <laughs> You're wondering what the title is? Yeah. Do you want to... Uh, oh, how to skyrocket your traffic in two days. Wait, do you want to start this recording over again? I can, I can go. I can go. Get, uh, you could have kept going, but uh, we'll, right. we'll restart. We'll restart, the, re- we'll restart the recording again. So, sorry. Sorry, live. <laughs> sorry, live. <laughs> yeah. Th- th- this is your old title for the November update. It's two days after your traffic. What November update? November mastermind update. Oh, okay, 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 got it, got it. Right, love it. Ready? All right, we're you, you like yeah. my title change? It's good. <laughs> I need context sometimes. Sorry, here we go. Uh, three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue. And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about how to skyrocket your traffic in two days. So, Neil, I mean. This is very intriguing. How does one skyrocket their traffic in two days? So there's a lot of tactics that are too hard to break down in a five to 10 minute podcast episode. You agree with this? Agreed. So what Eric and I are doing is on November 4th and 5th, is that when it is? Mm-hmm. We're doing an in-person event in Malibu, California. Yep. And you can always attend by going to marketingschool.io slash live and apply there to attend. 
Now, what are some of the crazy cool things that we're going to cover there that are going to be hard for people to learn over five or 10 minutes? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, Neil, you and I have been in these types of groups before is when you get a level of intimacy with super successful marketers and entrepreneurs, the level of learnings that you get just from having a, a casual conversation or doing roundtables with the people, um, even if you learn one or two things, these are the types of things that can skyrocket not only your traffic, but your revenues too. Like I remember being in groups in the past where I just learned one tactic take it and use that and boom, my conversion rate increases and my traffic doubles over time. And we've seen that time and time again. Yes, yeah, sp speaking of revenue, like one of the attendees who's gonna be there in November, he specializes in pricing and uh, in, in general, from everyone who I've known that's used his service, they see at least a 15% increase yeah. in revenue just from his price. And he charges a hundred thousand dollars at least minimum. Yeah, that's true. He charges yeah. over a hundred grand, which is expensive, but he's good. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's easier to, uh, it, you can also read articles, uh, online about pricing yeah. as well, but learning the formula works really well. Uh, other things that we're doing too, is we're breaking down like growth hacks that'll work in 2020. Um, some that'll involve experimentation. Uh, for example, we have a ton of data on things like user experience because Google's all about user metrics, such as click-through rates, bounce rates, and we have a lot of cool hacks that take a little bit more time to implement, and we have a ton of data on what's working and what's not. Um, that'll probably take you know, 40, 50 minutes to break down and explain on what you can copy and how it can work for all the different industries out there because the user experience hacks and the changes in things like title tags and uh, website elements. It's different for e-commerce than B2B, uh, than SaaS and all these different categories. So to explain that takes sadly a bit more than five, six minutes. Yeah, and we're not gonna just talk about like, we don't want this to be a glorified conference at the end of the day. Um, Neil just mentioned one of the speakers. We are bringing in one of the world's renowned webinar experts too. We talk a lot about webinars, but ultimately it's it's these people that are in the day to day that understand you know how these kind of seven to eight, nine figure webinars work. And they'll explain kind of the ins and outs around it. This is kind of the 5% of stuff shared in the marketing and kind of entrepreneur uh, world that you're not going to see out about in the world. And we want to bring the right people together. And the other thing too, is we're not trying to make this group really big. We're making it a very small group. Um, it's supposed to be intimate, which means the quality of the learnings that you're going to get um, is going to be higher, which makes it easier to skyrocket your traffic faster. Well, well, think of it this way. So when you go to most conferences, there's speakers, they come and speak and then they leave. Sure, here you can network with the speakers, but that's not the main point. The real value is, is Eric and I are putting on something where we ourselves are also gonna be in the audience learning. We're bringing in people who are leveraging tactics that we wanna learn because we know they're gonna be effective in 2020. So we want you to have that same experience in which if we can learn from these people, you can as well. Sure, Eric and I will also be teaching and educating you guys on some tactics that we're leveraging that most people aren't. Um, but at the same time, we're also bringing in other people that are leveraging stuff that we'll learn for the very first time as well. Yep. And look, we want to make sure it's a top tier experience uh, at the end of the day, which is why I'm personally looking at all the applications and looking at the ones that uh, seem to be a, a, the right fit. And those of you that are, I will actually give a call to you. And again, we're not trying to have too many people in it, um, but we just want to give you a better sense of what's going to happen. And these, these meetings, I mean, this one's going to happen in Malibu, November 4th and 5th, but we're doing three two day meetings every single year. Um, so it's a chance to kind of connect and build strong relationships with people. And it's from groups like this, Neil and I, we literally just had lunch. It's the people that you surround yourself with um, that are going to help you get to the next level. Yeah, so make sure you check it out, marketingschool.io slash live, and we'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Ooh, SEO advice for a brand new YouTube channel. That should be a new topic for the future. Cool. All right, one minute, one minute. SEO advice for a brand new... <laughs> uh, storytelling for business. We're going to add that into the queue for today. A lot of really good titles, guys, uh, today. Straight. A lot of really good ones. Look, I'm invisible on Slack. Storytelling, yay. I'll change the one after that to storytelling for business. Let me know when you guys are ready to go. We. I think I'm in it. Oh, yeah. Noah must I'll, use. I'll, I'll push and record and I'll bounce out. Okay. Wow, you're going to bounce out on us? going to bounce out. All right, don't go too long. We're ready. Oh, you've been holding it for a while. And three, two, two one.
Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Su. And I'm Neil Patel. And today we are going to talk about SEO advice for a brand new YouTube channel. So first one, first bit of advice. If you're starting a brand new YouTube channel, you gotta have the right tools in place. I prefer using TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is a Chrome plugin. It allows you to do keyword research, it allows you to tag things at scale. It allows you to do kind of split testing, image creation, all these different things that help grow your YouTube channel, not just from an SEO perspective, but overall. Yeah, do you wanna know a secret on how I'm able to grow my YouTube channel so fast? Your email list. Uh, email list is one, push notifications. Push notifications from, uh, what do you use, subscribers? Yeah, you can use anything, yeah. but. Subscribers.com, guys. Uh huh. So most people, like there's all these tools like vidIQ and everyone's optimizing for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found this for a lot of other YouTube channels as well because we create them in different languages. Mm -hmm. So we found that over everything, if you just email blast and you do a push notification in the first 24 hours, your videos crush it because YouTube SEO is all about the first 24 hours. It's not about what happens after the first week or two. So like with your content, you guys crank out a lot of content. You don't mm -hmm. push them hard in the first 24 hours. We used to have push notifications on. I'm, I've kind of debated putting them back and not, and not for the longest time, but you're kind of compelling me again. <laughs> But I, I kid you not, that's why we do so well on yeah. YouTube. And, and your and YouTube just grown so fast too. What are you at now? I think like four hundred and something. And last you know, year you're at two hundred. I just cut my one hundred thousand subscriber plaque. Like it just that took came. you so long. I don't know. They never sent it until recently. Carlos that's crazy. hit him up. He's like, "Can we get it?" Yeah. And I ping them in support. And yeah. I kid you not, like two three months. They're like, "We're still looking to this. They can never figure out." Carlos, dude, figured it when out you get to like, a million, you just ask your Google ad rep to get it for you. Yeah, I should do that. Yeah. But here's the big thing. So. I'll tell you two things because I've played around so much with our algorithm. Mm -hmm. Everyone, if you don't have a channel that, I mean, if you don't have a big email list, that's okay. Push on your social media, whatever you can within the first 24 hours, Twitter, LinkedIn, anywhere you can. I know sometimes they don't like YouTube videos, but the key is the first 24 hours. But here's something else that I learned. If you get too many people too fast, it goes against you because they think you're cheating. So because I do push notifications and my list is too large. So you throttle it? I had to throttle it. So I'll do the, I'll stagger the deliverability. Uh -huh. So then that way it goes over a few hours uh -huh. and then it, may, it actually causes my videos to do better than if mm -hmm. I send them all within a 10 minute window because yeah. they think it's just bot traffic yeah. and they don't count the views. Yeah. Um, but I kid you not for everyone listening, the biggest trick is you get more views in the first 24 hours and then you'll rank. So now let's go over ways you can get the most amount of views in the first 24 hours because not everyone's gonna have a big email list or a push notification list. Yeah, well, one thing one thing I wanna add around because this, this one's around SEO advice for it. One thing I'll say, our mutual friend Syed has a, has a WordPress plugin. So I, I'm assuming a lot of us use WordPress. If not, it's fine. Uh, but there's a plugin called uh, YouTube Subscribe. And basically I can go to Neil's channel, take one of his videos that I like. I might have an SEO blog post. I'll take one of his SEO videos and I'll put it on the blog post. And then when you hit the subscribe button, it actually subscribes to my channel, not his. The other thing too, ideally you put your own video on there because it increases the dwell time on your own site. Good for SEO. Yeah, but so in general for SEO advice, if you're trying to link on YouTube, I kid you not, it's not as much as like, yeah, keywords and all that still matter mm -hmm. just like traditional SEO. Yes, yeah, so you won't but, see a good bang for your buck. Yeah, but it's all views in the first 24 hours. So the videos mm -hmm. that are popular in the first 24 hours and have good engagement rank the best on YouTube from everything that we've seen. I'll say, um, to answer your question more directly, I think um, what's been working for us recently, God, I should really turn notifications on. Now I really just want to do it right now. Team, we're, we're turning it back on. But um, one thing that's worked for us, we actually had... Um, a conversation with um, the guy that works with Evan Carmichael. I think his name is uh, Jimmy or something. Two million subscribers or so. He got on a call with us, did, did a consultation. He gave us like a lot of things to do. So we ended up doing all the things. Um, thank you for that. And um, basically, instead of making your videos five minutes each, we, we increased it to 10 minutes each. So the watch time is increasing. So watch time helps a lot. Um, and then the, the push definitely, like the promotion, that's like major impact thing. But we found that when we started increasing it, we started to get more wins. I, I think like 30 to 40% of our, our videos would actually um, go above average. Whereas when we did like five minutes or so, um, they would all, a lot of them would fall kind of below average. Oh, you average. just increase your length of your video? Yeah, and yeah, what we, I would do is I just start- five minute videos. I, yeah, I know, but <laughs> you, all you have to do is just add a story to each one and then it goes to 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah, you don't need 10 minutes. We found mm -hmm. the sweet spot's like 7A, mm -hmm. anything around there plus yeah. is great. We try to keep it under 10 because uh, LinkedIn doesn't want videos over 10 minutes. Oh, so multi-purpose. Uh-huh. Yeah. So then you can use on channel. Okay, so going back to how do you make sure you can do well in the first 
uh, 24 hours, even if you don't have a big email list and push notification, well, email out to whoever you have, push out to whoever you have. If you don't have, start collecting emails and pushes. Uh, tweet out every single video multiple times in the first 24 hours using different titles. Um, you can push it out on your LinkedIn. Uh, you can tell people on Instagram to head over to YouTube if you're using any other social platform. We don't recommend ads though. N no, because the problem yeah. with ads is it takes a while to get them ramped up and approved. Another thing that I do is I have a lot of people, like a community of marketers that I know, you can ask them, hey, check out this video, you can notify them. Mm -hmm. So if you like it, leave a comment, and engage with them. I found that that helps too because it's creating good engagement in the first 24 hours. Facebook groups too. Facebook group groups as well, Reddit. although Facebook, yeah, yeah, Reddit, where else can they promote? Those, I mean, those are kind of the, the starting points. I mean, look, if you're starting from scratch, you're gonna have to hit all these, you're gonna have to, um, what, what I would say, like, if you have a really good piece, you reach out to the people that you might've mentioned in a video, that's ego bait true. always works. Th th that's great too, yeah. and email them, ask them to push it. Mm -hmm. um, and then do you, do you uh, transcribe your videos and get SRT files? We, we yeah, we use rev for that, rev.com. Yeah, and you upload them to every YouTube video? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works well too. Yeah, because um, YouTube, although they do automatic transcription, it's not the same as if you upload it yeah. manually. You'll find you'll get higher rankings as well. They're almost there. Um, all right. So anyway, those are a couple things you can do to kind of get started uh, if you have a brand new channel. Thank you. Special thanks to Storytelling for Business uh, coming from our YouTube live for that question. That is it for today. But if you'd like to see us live, L I V, go to marketingschool.io slash live. That's L I V. You can join Neil and myself in Malibu, November fourth and. 5th fifth and we'll see you tomorrow oh so his topic idea was not storytelling it was uh youtube yeah his his, his channel is storytelling but that's a good topic too storytelling for business no i gotta there's a question here let's do the high converting landing page one because that was earlier right? jwe revolution says is neil and eric married yes we are i'm married you're not married Oh, I thought, uh, to I each other. Together. Yeah, I thought I, I interpreted it as are we together. I said yes. Uh, would you do trailer native videos on LinkedIn and push to YouTube? Post full ones. Huh? Storytelling for business. Can you rephrase your question, please? The market of podcasts in India. I don't know. It's young now, but it'll grow within four or five years. Jai, I think the moment you start to see it tick up when, when people around you maybe start mentioning podcasts, I think um, even starting now is a good time to do it because it takes time to build that following. Anyway, are we ready? Yep. All right. All right, we are rolling. <clears throat> and three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue, And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to give you the high converting landing page formula. So... I guess I can start first. You want me to start? I'll start actually okay, go on for this it. one. The, the, the key to landing page, and then we can go into the tactics. Mm -hmm. The key to landing page is first answering objections. Most people, when they're thinking about landing pages, they're like, oh, here's Russell Brunson's webinar formula, or oh, I saw this case study on conversion Excel, and this is what I'm gonna copy, or oh, my competitor's running A-B task, and I can see that through built width, and I'm just gonna copy this page. The key to a successful landing page first comes down to objections. You gotta find out what issues people have and why they're not converting. And the most important thing you can do is answer those objections within the copy, whether it's video, audio, pictures, images, testimonials. Answering objections is the key to a high converting landing page. And the way you first get those is you can run surveys through Qualaroo, SurveyMonkey, any of those tools to figure out what issues people have because Google Analytics is a quantitative. It tells you numbers and drop-off rates, but it doesn't tell you what people's feedback is. Uh, you can even use tools like usertesting.com to figure out what issues people have. Then once you have that, now it's time to create that high converting landing page. So let's go into how they can create that high converting landing page once they know the issues people have and what they're answering on the page. Which is a big piece. If you don't understand the objections and you don't figure out ways to frame around it, you that kind of goes into the content that you're creating on the page. But first thing I would share is we, we talk about headlines a lot. And, you know, Ogilvy himself said 80 cents on the dollar is basically spent on the headline. If you can't grab their attention um, on the landing page with, that, with a strong headline, um, you risk losing a lot of people. 
people and you don't want to waste all that money um, that you've invested in a landing page just to fall flat on the headline. So if you want to know how to write good headlines, um, magnetic headline formula from uh, copy blogger, I always recommend reading Breakthrough Advertising and which you can now buy for $125, I believe. So you don't have to pay the same $600 that I paid. Um, 125 bucks, you can get yourself a copy of that. That that book will make you money many times over. Um, but yeah. Go. Yeah, and, and you know, when Eric's talking about 80 cents on the dollar spent on the headline, it's true. So there's a fact that eight out of 10 people will read your headline, but only two out of 10 will click through and read the rest. In other words, you're losing six out of 10 people on your headline by not making it appealing enough. Um, the next thing I would consider doing is have visual aspects that explain your message and multiple variations of them. I found that some people love reading text, some people like looking at images, some people prefer uh, watching videos. And I learned this from uh, conversion rate experts. They ran a test on Crazy Egg back in the day. We figured out all the objections and we took all of them, created amazing copy we drove people, the conversion rates went up. And what was funny is we took the same copy and also turned it into video and had the video and the text and give people an option to view either one. And our conversion rates went through the roof because we quickly learned that not everyone is a reader. Some people just prefer videos, especially now because we all have smartphones. To, to that point, actually, um, we, we talk about, there's a lot of different chat programs out there. You can use intercom or you can use drift. Um, and when people land on the page, sometimes they have questions like our, for our, uh, our growth accelerator mastermind, the, the one that we're doing in November, um, when people land on the page, marking school.io slash live L I V E, what happens is people start asking questions. There's a little, little chat on the bottom and people are like, it just, do you have any questions about our, our mastermind? And people start asking questions and then it pushes to our Slack and we start engaging with the people immediately. And, and, you know, that leads to conversation, that leads to conversions. Some people like to just start engaging in a conversation, they're further down the funnel. Some people like, you know, reading a, a piece of text. Some people like, um, you know, maybe watching a video. Who knows, right? You don't, you just don't know who you're interacting with, so you kind of have to cover your bases. Yeah, um, an another thing with landing pages that you'll end up finding is some people like short landing pages. I found that it's better to be longer and thorough because as long as you're getting across every single objection and you have multiple call to actions under each section, that's fine. If people want to skim or they just want to get to it and purchase, they can. But I found that it's better to be longer than just have a short page and everyone's like, oh, short to the point, let me just get them to click on the button. You'll get people to click on the button, but you'll see a big drop off on let's say your checkout page or your sign up page or your lead collection page. So for that reason, I rather have a more in-depth, longer page with call to action sprinkled throughout to try to get people to the next step versus just forcing people to click on the next link. Yeah, and don't forget housekeeping item here. Don't forget to add the relevant pixels on these pages. So if, if it makes sense to add your Google Analytics, go ahead and add it. But you probably wanna add your advertising pixels on these pages and then maybe the next, the thank you page too, because then you have a sense of where they ended up in the funnel and then you can market to them accordingly. Because if they didn't buy and they watch something, uh, maybe there's a good chance for you to retarget them and then get a better uh, cost per acquisition at the end of the day. So that's kind of table stakes. And, and a few things, I'm just gonna start rattling off tactics that can boost your conversion rates. Exit pop-up, easy win. Uh, if someone's gonna leave, might as well try to get them at a last ditch uh, effort. You can have a top bar that scrolls. That's a great way to draw people's attention to wherever you want. Um, having testimonials, case studies on a landing page, those help well too. Make sure your buy buttons aren't an image where it's like an image filled with everything. I recently looked at a buy page or a landing page the other day and someone's buy button wasn't just a buy button, it had images all around, it was one big image. And I didn't realize it was clickable, it just looked like a graphic instead of a button. So make sure your buttons actually look like buttons. Uh, consider also putting chat on your landing page. I found that average, adding intercom to our page drastically boosts conversions because everyone always has miscellaneous questions and you can't always answer them. Uh, you know, and speaking of questions, another thing that we like adding to our landing pages is a FAQ. Uh, another quick tip is whatever your landing page is, you have a funnel from there, they go to a next page and maybe a checkout page and then a thank you page. Have congruent messaging that flows throughout all of them because when the messaging ties, you'll find that you'll get a higher conversion rate than when you just use random landing pages that don't fit in well with each other. 
Don't forget too. don't forget to add video as well. When I say video, if you're doing a video, don't forget to add the transcript. So we use Wistia on one of our pages and a lot of people are going to play video without sound on. So if you start the video, make sure you have a transcript in there so people can just start reading. That makes it easier. Um, and some people just leave the sound off the whole time. Like I, I know when I'm sometimes when I'm reading landing pages, I just read the text for whatever reason, instead of turning the sound on, maybe because it's in the evening and I, I don't want to get annoyed. Um, but that, that's another thing that you can do. Um, we talk a lot about site speed too. So don't, we, we talk about some things, that elements that add to the landing page, but you don't want to bog it down with too much stuff that's going on. Um, because if it starts to slow down things, guess what? That's not a good user experience at the end of the day. And if you're spending money driving traffic to that landing page, um, that could cost you a lot. And take a look at swipes.co. There's a lot of landing page examples there. Plus there's a lot of long form copy examples as well. So if you want to get good ideas for, for long form copy and landing pages, that's a spot that will kind of hit two in one. And then uh, land-book.com is where I like to draw uh, more landing page examples. Yeah. And if you want to meet Eric and I in person in Malibu, check out marketingschool.io slash live. We look forward to seeing and meeting you in person. Storytelling for business. Would you post a YouTube link on LinkedIn or post a trailer natively to post the full YouTube video? If you're just trying to get more YouTube views and boost it, then post your YouTube video on LinkedIn. If you ideally want the most amount of views, it doesn't matter what channel, take the video, re-upload it to LinkedIn and you'll do better. Jaya, um, I used to use WP SuperCache. We might've changed it to WP Rocket. What, what caching plugin do you use? None, WP Engine doesn't allow any. Oh, we're, we're on, we're, what are we on? Oh, we're on Kinsta now, I think. Maybe they have their own. I don't know. But yeah, to Neil's point, before we switched to WP Engine, um, we did have w WP Super Cache, and yeah. I think we had to take it off. And now we're on Kinsta, so I don't know what we use anymore. Yeah, and I'm about to switch to DreamHost, so I don't know, but I'm probably going to try true. W3 Total Cache. Yep, and I'm going to move over too. So whatever you use, you tell me. Um, and then Jeff says, do you suggest posting audio only podcasts to YouTube with static graphics? Do you suggest posting audio? No, because because natively people are used to watching videos on YouTube. I've tried that in the past. Yeah, it doesn't work. Engagement's not good, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. remember because when you first started doing it, you're like, hey, do you want to upload it to your YouTube channel? I'm like, no, yeah. I'm going to take my overall yeah. channel authority. I'm yeah, like, it, the watch <laughs> time and everything, people are just like, what is this? They want to watch stuff, which is why we're live on video right now too because you are, um, you're watching a live video. I don't know. Um, so anyway, next one. Should you? What's the next one? Should you get rid of a service? No. Oh. You need like a minute. Should you convert your YouTube video to podcast? Uh, Gemini's, yes, you should convert your YouTube video to podcast because that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're converting our, this is YouTube, this is LinkedIn, this is on Twitch, this is on Facebook. This is will go to podcast as well. This will go to Spotify, this will go to Google Play, it'll go to Apple, it'll go everywhere. Except it won't go to SoundCloud anymore because SoundCloud has been um, not that good for us. Yeah, we are rolling. Rolling? All right. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue, And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about seven different customer acquisition ideas for the rest of 2019. So acquisition idea number one. Number one is channel partnerships. So a lot of people don't pursue channel partnerships because it takes so long to get going. But if you could just make a list of the top 25 people that you should be working with or businesses, just reach out to them, find out what type of collaborations they do, find out what their goals are. Um, you get that relationship building, then it can lead to doing maybe a, a joint blast, an email blast, right? Or doing a joint webinar or doing maybe um, other things where they speak at your conference and you speak at theirs, right? We're, we're going up and up higher and higher on the funnel, but you can start with as simple as a blog post or like an email blast or like a tweet retweeting each other, but you're looking to build a relationship, make that top 25 list of people, be relentless, go after them for maybe, you know, three to six months or so. And then you're going to have these relationships. Maybe, maybe you only have five of the 25, but that's still five more relationships that are strong that you didn't have in the beginning. Yeah. Another thing that I love, and I've talked about this, but very few people do it. So one of big, my big traffic drivers for 2019, and it will be for 2020 and beyond is free tools. Like how I have an AB testing calculator, SEO analyzer, Uber suggest, whatever it may be. And you can do simple stuff. I know many of you guys are like, Neil, I can't afford to do what you're doing. No worries. I got a solution for you. It's called code Canyon. Code Canyon is a site where you can buy already existing. Let's say you have a marketing agency. You can buy an SEO tool and just slap it onto singlegrain.com. Uh, or you can buy a mortgage tool or a 
free uh, parking, you know, map tool or whatever it may be. There's tools for every industry on Code Canyon, and they only charge anywhere from like two to twenty dollars for one of these tools to be popped onto your site. That's two to twenty dollars one-time fee, not monthly, not reoccurring. Really cheap, really affordable. Everyone here should be able to do it. Uh, you can also go to 1ksideprojects.com too. I, I think I talk, talked about this at Marketing School Live, but same same idea. You can buy sites for less than $1,000. A lot of developers go there to throw their their, their projects away. Um, so it's literally the number 1ksideprojects.com, and I, I think that's the site. Um, and then what are we on, number three? Yeah. Uh, number three. So number three, I think even though we talk about it, it doesn't mean a lot of people are doing it. A lot of people are producing con content in vacuums. I think thinking about how you can take... Uh, like this video that we have, for example, will become many podcast episodes. It's also publishing to LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Twitch at the same time. And then it's going to Spotify, it's going to Google Play, it's going to all these different um, channels, but we're repurposing it. And then the ones that actually take off, like Neil's actually gonna go make, make some videos and, and put them on his YouTube channel. We might look at the ones that take off and say, okay, let's make them into long form blog posts. But it's taking away a lot of the thinking because a lot of, the, when it comes to content production, it, the thinking is a really stressful part. Like how do I come up with new ideas? What do I do next? What do I do next? But if you have a process for it where you're able able to expand your content, it's going to make your life a lot easier. And then you're also not putting all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Number four, Jetson AI. So we all talk about voice search, but everyone's like, oh, we get all this voice search traffic. What are we going to do? How can we end up monetizing it? Jetson AI is going to make this possible where it's easier for you to monetize your business through voice search, whether it's service or e-commerce space. Check it out. Think of it as like a Shopify, but for voice devices like Alexa, and they make it where people through these voice devices can quickly order uh, products from you guys, uh, services from you guys, sign up as a customer, uh, and they're doing it for all industries, even including like local restaurants and businesses, and it's really affordable. Number five is Pattern 89. So there's a lot of talk about AI for advertising and Pattern 89 actually does that. Um, we've seen on average that they increase performance, ad performance by an average of 21% or so. And what it does is it basically look at your accounts and be like, okay, this uh, ad set isn't working that well. You should make, you should take that budget and reallocate it here. So it takes a lot of the thinking away. There's a lot of suggestions in there. I think the next step is just full automation, but you know, right now it's at the suggestion stage. Maybe it does do that already, but it'll help you with your Facebook ads. It'll help you with your YouTube ads. Hey, you should stop spending on this demographic and you know, this is what's going on. So ultimately it's a time saver and it's to help you make more money. Yeah, uh, number six, SEO is moving towards machine learning and AI. There's tools like ClickFlow that Eric has. Uh, Distilled also has a tool called, I think, ODN or something like mm -hmm. the Online Discovery Network. And uh, what these tools do is it automates SEO for you so you don't have to do as much work. Um, and that's great because whether you have a CMS or not, it puts a piece of JavaScript on your website and then it's able to make the HTML changes for you. I do believe that is the future. Uh, reason being is who wants to go and make 100 manual SEO changes when you can just do it all automated through... Uh, JavaScript and then you yourself don't have to have as many people implementing it and you should have less errors as well. Yeah, number seven is there's there are a lot of different chat programs out there. Um, I personally like Intercom quite a bit. And Intercom allows you to build um, a lot of different, you can build chat funnels, right? Or you can have an operator there that's kind of serving people. It also has product tours in there too. So it's kind of becoming this all in one kind of, you know, chat management, contact management type of tool and there's product tours. The reason I like product tours is because it helps with onboarding. You can also put it on uh, specific pages on your site to help increase conversions too. So if someone is on like your checkout page, and this is something that Neil shared during uh, Marketing School Live uh, a couple months back, but guiding people to take a certain action that can help increase conversion rates. What, what did you see when, when you shared that stat? The product tours on the checkout page, like 15%? I think it was like 12 or 13% or somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah, something like that. So anyway, that is it for today, but don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. It helps us grow. And if you'd like to see Neil and myself and a bunch of high-powered marketers and entrepreneurs entrepreneurs uh, in Malibu, November 4th and Malibu, 5th. Malibu, California, right outside of Los Angeles. Yeah, beautiful city, by the way. Markingschool.io slash live, L-I-V-E. Do you want to add something? Yeah, it's a beach city, so we'll all see you there. Yeah, goodbye. Let's see, how many do we do today? We can probably get in at least one more. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's do two more. Yeah, let's do the niche down your agency yeah. as well. Cool. Ready? Yep. And we are rolling. Three, two, one. 
Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Su. And I'm Neil Patel. And today we are going to talk about what experiential marketing is. There's an experience going on behind us, by the way. We put this in on purpose. There are sirens in downtown light. That's experiential for you. <laughs> and we did not put it in on purpose. He's just joking around. Yeah. So experiential marketing, I mean, I think the definition is, a good example is um, Halo. So Halo, Halo partnered up with an organization that actually owns the Harlem Globetrotters as well. So I have a friend that, um, that runs that entire organization, um, Andrew Wexler, and um, I met up with him and he um, introduced me to someone from his team called, um, how, name, name is Howard Smith, the president of um, kind of these experiences. So Halo is a game which was kind of started by Xbox, Microsoft, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to get into live experiences. So they started doing these live tours around the US where you can go, you can play like a uh, laser tag, there's like um, Halo experiences, there's a lot of Halo, like there's like live signings, things like that. That's an experience. And you're getting to experience the whole brand, you bring people into it, and it's worthwhile, it's, it, it's um, look, it's remarkable. I'm losing my voice. Yeah, and a lot of brands are starting to do this. Um, like Red Bull, when the Oculus goggles and everything came out, they would have videos of people jumping from outer space uh, and you know landing back on Earth, and they would show it to you in 3D, uh, and it's all Red Bull branded, and it makes you feel like you're right there. You know, you're on the edge of your seat. You're experiencing the thrill. Uh, to even Google having pop-up shops and you can go in and experience all their new products like Google Home and play around with them, mm -hmm. uh, play games, uh, I saw that. interact I had, with um, the devices. Yeah, it was geez. right by my house. Right by your house. And also they do, they do this at conferences. They have the most expensive booths and you can go experience all their products there. That's right. Yep. Uh, and there's a lot of companies that are doing the same thing. And, and the reason being is when you can experience something, you're much more likely to buy it. I was at uh, the Century City Plaza Mall. Mm -hmm. Not this, uh, yeah, this weekend that just passed. You know, like that Thero gun that like just yeah. hits you and yeah. makes you like... Uh, feel loose like that massage gun yeah they had this like this pop-up shop and i was there and they were like giving me a free massage they're like yeah. would you want any and i was like no thank you it was like yeah. 300 dollars, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i got to experience it and then yeah. my wife was like oh do you want it she's like we can get it and i'm like no it's okay it wasn't as good as i thought but at least yeah. i got to experience it yeah so now it's remarkable because now you're talking about it and we're broadcasting it to a million <laughs> listeners a month although i probably didn't generate as many sales by yeah. telling them it's yeah. not that good but the thing is word of mouth it. is one of the most powerful things too right and, and we look at disney that's an experience in itself but everyone talks about how great disneyland is yeah th th that's right so it's like Look, for a lot of the people listening, your business, including Eric and I business, our business isn't big enough where we can just go all around and like do our own version of Halo and have people mm -hmm. play laser tag with each other. We would go broke if we did that. Yep. Uh, we're not but we Microsoft. do give experiences to people. But, but, but yeah, but check this out. Our yeah. experiences are really simple that everyone here who's listening can replicate. For example, good customer support. Mm -hmm. Most people offer shitty customer support. Yeah. That's a good experience. If you mm -hmm. look at companies like New Bank, they're that bank that's valued at over $10 billion. What do they do? They just provided a better experience than their old school competitors. You can also do things like producing better content, whether it's video content, uh, podcast content, going live like we're doing here right now. If you're listening to this podcast later on, you won't see us live. But these are all examples of experiences because not only are we giving advice on marketing, we're interacting with people through our live video and answering questions right then and there. These are all examples of stuff that you can do for your business. You can even do live chat. You can offer amazing experiences helping them out through live chat, even if it's not related to your core product or service, but it's within your industry and you have advice to give them. If you can help them, you can do that. We also do webinars, right? Mm -hmm. You've done webinars a lot. That's an amazing experience in and mm -hmm. of itself. Yep. Also, don't forget too, if you have people on your team, the employee experience that you have too, that's also experiential because that markets to people outside to help your business grow. So that helps your business market itself. Yep. Yeah. So in general, get creative, leverage a lot of the channels out there, but go above and beyond than just say, Hey, we're going to release some content and get some traffic, reduce some SEO or paid ads. The real key is if you're on a shoestring budget, interact and engage with your audience. It could be as simple as going live on your Instagram, you know, once a week, even if you barely have anyone listening, that's okay. If you look at Eric, when he first started off, he would go live and we would do this podcast on marketing school. 
And when he would go live, sometimes there's only like five or six people <laughs> live. And I was like, we could, if you want, I didn't mind. But in my head, I was thinking like, all right, what's the point? But I do know that, hey, over time, he would build his audience and Eric was persistent. Now, when we go live, in many cases, there's over a hundred people live, right? It's just being persistent and it's trying to create all these different kind of experiences. And if you block off time to just do these simple things, your audience, your fan base, your community, it'll start growing. They'll love you. They'll appreciate it. And over time, people will sign up as a customer due to it. All right. So it's important. Check it out. That is it for today. Before well, we go. We also have another experience that we're doing in person in yeah. Malibu. If you guys want to learn more, go to marketingschool.io slash live. November 4th and 5th. Goodbye. We got one more? Yeah, let's do it. Niche down. All right. Let's do it. I thought I lost my voice. Okay, we are rolling. Three, two, two one. Welcome to another episode of Marketing School. I'm Eric Sue. And I'm Neil Patel. And today we're going to talk about if you should niche down your agency. So we get, we actually, believe it or not, there's a lot of agency owners that listen to this podcast. Um, so this can tie into the context of if you have a services business too. Um, and I, I think to an extent, when you think about products, niching down um, does help quite a bit. I remember I had someone on the Growth Everywhere podcast, we're now called Leveling Up, a uh, company called Kahuna. And when they started niching down and focusing on a very specific niche, like the company was, was tanking. And then after they niched down, they started skyrocketing. So my opinion on this and maybe bvxl mm -hmm. they're for just shopify and e-commerce they've yep. done really well yep. a lot of agencies that niche down uh business online just mm -hmm. does enterprise yep uh b2b they've yep. done well from that i think they got to like 10 million a year yep but in a sense like okay so with your with your agency you know you do niche down to a degree what does no, your niche look like we don't niche down we're global because you target specific sizes no, we don't target specific. Oh, no, no, no. You have Neil Patel Excel too. I forgot yeah, about we, that. Yeah, we have both the SMB yeah. agency yeah. and an enterprise. Yeah. We do all markets from low end mom and pops who are starting off because we believe why should only big companies be able to mm -hmm. pay marketing agencies? Yeah. We go go through your, your, your thoughts first. Yeah. So yeah. my end is I do everything from people starting off their business all the way to Fortune 1000 companies that generate over 100 billion plus a year in market cap. Um, or even revenue in some cases. And I don't niche down, but you know, I'll, I'll be up front. I don't think most people will be able to replicate what I'm doing. I don't think I'm smarter or better. It's just more so I have a ton of leads. Uh, I was going through this with Eric the other day. I started turning on lead collection on Ubersuggest. I'm generating 2,900 leads a day. Higher. <laughs> uh, what? Higher. Well, yeah, but in general, it's 2,900. Right now, it's started going up to around 3,800 leads a day. So it, there's a certain point where it's just like, I have people from all industries, but I know most people can't relate to that. And my recommendation is, if I was starting a brand new business, not using my name, not using my lead flow, I would niche down. And the reason I would niche down, and this is for the one reason only, and I learned this earlier on in my career and I saw a huge revenue increase, when people say like, oh, you niche down, you can focus and you can be better and you can specialize. That's not the real reason why most people end up making more money by niching down at the beginning. It's because when you niche down, you can get case studies in a specific area and you can leverage those case studies to get more clients in that space. Yes, over time, you should be able to produce better work because you're only focusing on that one client type. But what really makes you the money with your agency early on if you niche down is you can take those case studies and then go after all the other competitors in the space and lock them down as a client as well. To Neil's point, I think the um, the experience that you get when you niche down, naturally you're starting to work on it more so you understand the industry more. I will tell you, like, uh, let's say we work with a lot of software companies, right? They do look at the breadth of experience that we have and they ask, like, who else have we worked with in the space? And to Neil's point, the case studies certainly go a long way. The sales cycles are shorter. The, the lifetime value of the customers are a lot higher. Um, and it's because they, they feel more confident in, in that respect. I think once you get to a certain size and you're growing at a certain rate, I think it's okay to open it up to... Like, let's open it more general let's let's target smaller let's target really big enterprise too you can kind of you know hit the breadth of it but i think especially when you're really early days i think if you're starting out as one person um and you're looking to build your team i think it's important because there's a lot of big agencies out there like the omnicoms of the world that are already targeting a lot of people um so you know how can you differentiate yourself the way you differentiate yourself is by niching down at least in the beginning and whatever you choose to do in the future if you want to make the agency a lot bigger you you have to open it up because you know markets are markets. Um, but 
I think niching down to me doesn't mean just focusing on one. I I, I think most people think it's just you focus you you can everything and you focus on on one thing. Niching down from what I've learned from kind of other agencies owners is you're probably focusing on three to four niches that you're good at. Um, maybe like you know you have to have multiple team members, but start with one first. Maybe you'd op- open up to four. So once things really start cranking, then you can open up to more and more and more, um, and then you have a you know well oiled machine going for you. So that's kind of my take on it. You know you you start small first, niche down, and then you can expand. Just like how you know Apple you know started with a computer first, then added you know iPods, iPhones, and then iPads too, and watches. So take your time. And it'll work. Yeah, and if you look at Apple as a huge company, they don't go after healthcare, cars, and everything at once. Mm-hmm. They pick something, get it right, and then they expand after they get it right. Yep. Uh, because they know no matter how what size you are, small or large, and all of us as small businesses, at least we're all small compared mm-hmm. to the apples of the world, we should learn from them and go small and perfect what you're doing and then expand from there. If you're in a rare situation where you have abundance of everything, by all means, you don't have to niche down, but... I still recommend picking a sector or a category at first. All right, so that is it for today. And before we go, don't forget to go to marketingschool.io slash live, that's L-I-V-E, and the event is happening in Malibu. Neil and I will be there. See us in person, it's gonna be great. Again, marketingschool.io slash live, and we'll see you tomorrow. Let me save these questions for next time. So live people right now, uh, Joseph, Michael, um, I'm gonna save your questions. Uh, Move close to the mic. Oh yeah. Like similar to Eric. I'm like right on it, I'm like this. Eric, how I met Neil Patel. Um, I met Neil Patel online. Um, it's basically like online dating. But no, I, I read I read his blog and um, you know, reached out to him. And that, that's how we started talking. Um, what's a, should we save Joseph Michaels? Could you break down the work your agency performs in house versus what aspects of the business you outsource? Um, we do everything in house. I'm assuming you do too. Mm-hmm. We don't really outsource anything. Uh, Eric, uh, what is the method? And, to earn and money? the reason being, Joseph, if you have an agency, what you'll find is you can try outsourcing but things start breaking down and you won't do as well and produce as good results. It's just easier to bring things in house. Sometimes you outsource some things like writing here and there or whatnot, but in general, you want to try to do as much as possible in house. Yep. Kevin King, uh, transcriptions to videos. I use rev that's R A V.com. You can use Amazon has a transcription tool. It's very cheap right now. We just haven't gotten around to it yet. It's, it's, but it's way cheaper. Is it way cheaper than rev? Way cheaper. Really? I'll hey, have to try hey, this out. Yeah. You look into it. Let me know how it goes. Well, we use it for languages. Automated. We have? Uh, Rev Automated, and it's been great. How, how much is it? Way better quality than Amazon. Really? Yeah, because yeah, oh, a- Amazon... Ten cents, ten cents a minute. Because the Amazon transcription services, if I'm not mistaken, they use machine learning. They don't use humans. Yeah. And, and we did that for like thousands and thousands, not even thousands, I think millions of terms, and yeah. it didn't work out as well as we yeah. wanted. Yeah. Um, but I never knew that Amazon has a manual translation process, so we've only used it automated. It's, it's automated. Yeah, oh, it's, only it's automated. automated. But yeah. Rev has an automated one that's a little bit better. better. Yeah. yeah, check out the Rev automated one over Amazon. Any LinkedIn questions before we go? Uh, let's see. How many people are live? I don't know. Uh, 40 on YouTube? We had 40 concurrent, we had like 250 sessions on YouTube. Yeah. And, and LinkedIn? LinkedIn, the most we had was about 30, 30 I guess. Cool. Yeah, it's better to use email tradition or email campaign to promote a product. Um, you can do either one. Uh, if you're doing email, like emails in general, it's better to use it than not use it at all. But when you're using emails, consider adding it to your drip. So that way you're constantly promoting. And then you can do, uh, segmentation or leveraging marketing automation, which if someone buys this product, then send them offers for these other products because they're related and they'd be ideal upsells. Yeah, uh, final, I'll answer the final question here. So it appears that YouTube anal- analyzes voice content and videos for copyright issues. Do you think that plays into SEO also? Um, I would say probably don't even think about that that much. Um, it, and- it, it, it does, but they prefer the manual uploaded SRT file. So yep. try to do that first. Yep. Okay, guys, that Thank is it for everyone. today. Have a good weekend. Um, be safe, have fun, and uh, get a lot of sun. Thanks for attending and watching. Goodbye. <laughs>